Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Your Hour with APA Virginia, sponsored by the Berkeley Group. Your Hour with APA Virginia is hosted on the fourth Monday of each month from noon to 1 p.m. I'm going to give everyone a minute to log in and get settled, and then we'll go from there. All right, thank you again for joining our webinar today. Before we get started, we want to remind you of a couple of exciting things happening um, at APA Virginia and a couple of things that are coming up. Um, right now, we are gearing up for our conference, which will be held at the Richmond Marriott downtown on July 19th through the 22nd. Our conference theme this year is We'll Get You Moving. Um, we will um, give some updates shortly um, in the coming weeks for, about registration and proposals and things like that. So stay tuned for more information. Um, we also have our webinar for next month, which is the basics of new markets tax credit. Um, the registration is still open, so make sure um, you register and we'll give you a link with the follow-up um, email for today. So as we do every month, this webinar, Modernizing Parking Standards, will be recorded and posted to our YouTube page by the end of today. We encourage you to visit our YouTube, which is right here, and see past webinars or share it with colleagues. As a reminder, we will hold questions until the end, but as the webinar is going on, feel free to type your questions in the question box box on your dashboard and we will answer them at the end in the order that they came in. Again, thank you to the Berkeley Group for making this webinar series possible. Um, we are always looking for new webinar topics um, or presenters, so if you have anyone you would like to see or to hear from, please email admin at apavirginia.com. This month's webinar, again, Modernizing Parking Standards, is presented by Katie North. Um, she is the Division Chief of Mobility Services for the City of Alexandria, which is the team that oversees various mobility options in the city. This includes managing competing curbside uses, including residential parking, metered parking, bike share, loading, and disability parking. Also with us today, we have Nathan McKeck. I'm sorry if I got that wrong. Um, he has been an active, oh, sorry. He has been an active participant in Alexandria city government, working to create a more vibrant and livable city. He is the chair of the Alexandria Planning Commission and vice chair of the Alexandria Waterfront Commission. We also have Melissa McMicon, I'm sorry. And she is the Transportation Research and Site Plan Development Manager for the Arlington County, Virginia's Commuter Services Bureau. She oversees the conditions, design, and monitor monitoring of transportation demand management in the new development projects, as well as the county's TDM research program housed in the Mobility Lab. So at this time, I will go ahead and turn over this screen to our presenters and once again please hold all questions until the end
Okay, this is Katie here. Can Paige, can you see my screen? Yes, everything's good to go. Okay. Um, well, again, this is Katie North, um, and I'm here with Nathan Masick and Melissa McMahon, and we are very excited to be able to talk to you about what we have done at the City of Alexandria to modernize our parking standards. Um, and we're thrilled for the participation on the online end, so thank you in advance for your attention and your interest in this topic. So we'll get right into it. So, Alexandria had a parking problem. Now, if you read the local newspapers, you'd think that the problem we had related to parking was that there just wasn't enough in the city. So this is a number of the different articles that we have in our local newspaper that had a thought on parking. However, in actuality, it was a much different par par parking problem. Like many cities, Alexandria's parking requirements were created decades ago, and we were requiring too much parking which has major implications for urban design, the public realm, affording affordable housing, and small businesses. Um, the graphic on the screen is some analysis that we did that showed that over 10% of the city is actually covered by a surface parking lot. And this factor doesn't even include all the on-street parking spaces or the surface park, or the structured parking or underground parking. So the city has a lot of parking um, and it's really shaping how our city is built out. So across the city, like many cities, we have seas of parking that ensure there's always going to be a parking space for anyone who might want to park there when they arrive. And over the years, while the city has done a good job of requiring that most of the new parking goes underground, um, it still is creating a lot of parking that goes unused, which we're going to talk about in our presentation. So these requirements have had major implications for the cost of housing, small businesses, and urban design. So when you think about the cost of a parking space being anywhere between $20,000 to $35,000 a space, this significantly impacts those affordable housing developments that are trying to maximize their dollars. Uh, with regard to small businesses, in our analysis, we looked at um, the cases that we were approving and found that 40% of the commercial cases that the city evaluated all requested a parking rejection. And all of these uh, were approved. And when you got down to who these businesses were, we found that two-thirds of them were actually small businesses, which meant that they had to wait an extra three to six months to actually start gaining revenue, earning income, um, just to go through this process that was, in essence, automatically approved. Um, and then thinking about urban design, I'm sure many of you have seen this graphic before, but when you look at the actual area that's required for parking, it's often larger than the use itself, which has major implica implications for what the city can look like. So we, as a city, recognized that this was a problem when we needed to change. Um, over the last decade, we have um, developed our tra transportation master plan and our environmental action plan through our EcoCity Alexandria program. And both of these plans included very strong goals that recognized that we needed to look at new updated parking requirements. Um, and then on the other hand, we, um, as we've been going through our small area plans for discrete parts of the city, as early as 2003, we started looking at individual or, or small area plan specific parking restrictions, parking requirements for those areas as a way to circumvent the zoning ordinance, which would have been a much bigger project. So these, these areas of um, development in the city were actually subject to um, different parking uh, restrictions, and in many cases, maximum parking re requirements. So there was also a lot of support for change in the trends that we were seeing. Um, car ownership itself, we were seeing higher percentages of uh, car lights or car-free households in Alexandria. Uh, we also considered the new transit options that had come into play uh, since we had first created these parking requirements. So um, we may think that Metro and our bus system have been around for decades, but our parking requirements were created before those, those two vital pieces of transit um, had even been in play. Uh, we also see many new modes of transportation. Um, in Alexandria, as part of the D.C. region, we are part of the Capital Bike Share Network. Um, and then we're seeing more and more people getting around by Uber, Lyft. Uh, and thinking about the retail office trends, um, recognizing that the, there are changes for how people have been getting around, getting what they purchase, getting how, how they get to work. Uh, you can literally buy anything you want online and have it delivered to your house without having to drive to a store and park there. 
Uh, same thing for working. We're seeing more and more options for teleworking or co-working um, that limit the amount of um, need for actually having parking spaces at an office building. So in 2013, we got down to the business of actually making a change. Uh, we, uh, the city council approved the creation of a task force, which would be comprised of residents and business groups and members of different commissions to look at these issues. And because it was such a big issue, uh, we decided to break it into two phases. So the first phase we'll talk about is residential, and the second phase will be commercial. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nate to talk about phase one. Well, thank you very much. And uh, so we'll talk about our phase one residential, which is hard to believe we completed over five years ago now at this point. Um, from March 2014 to April 2015. And to start this, we had a, uh, a community forum on why, why this matters. And we thought this was an important way to kick this off because uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a highly technical sort of analysis that we were doing and, and uh, you know, a real, real in-depth quantitative and, and policy analysis to under, underpin the, uh, the, the guidelines that we were coming up with. But at the same time, it's very emotional for people. Parking is very emotional. And as a you know, planning mission chair, um, it, more often than not, if there's an issue that someone wants to raise with the project, it's gonna be parking. So we see that time and time again. And um, having this panel discussion to launch this, bring experts in who offered their perspectives on this um, was important. We had, uh, as part of that session, we had Clark Ewart with Paradigm Development Company, which had been building some residential developments in the DC region and several in Alexandria, including several that were transatlantic developments. Um, Christopher Leinberger with um, George Washington University is an expert on transatlantic development. And Harriet Tregoning, who at the time was um, uh, the planning director for the District of Columbia, and was sharing the perspectives of what DC had done with, with their uh, program. So this was an effort to sort of uh, give somebody, every, give, give everybody in the community who is interested in this issue some foundational information about what we were planning to do and what others had done. So as part of this effort, we wanted to look not only to what we were doing, but also to what other communities were doing around the locally and around the country and to, to, to look at what the best practices were in this area. So there was uh, some extensive data collection that was conducted um, by the city consultant to review the local and national parking standards and see what, what the expectations were. So there's Alexandria at the top of this table and um, thinking about did you have minimums or maximums? Did you bundle parking or, or allow unbundling? Um, was shared parking an option? Were there residential parking permit program policies to consider or car share, bike share, other options? To what extent did they figure out how much parking you might require or permit? Um, how was transit taken into account? That's the one dot that you see in every box along with minimum. So everybody, everybody had minimums and everybody had lower ratios where you were proximate to transit in the cities that we look to as comparisons. Um, and also took into account carpool, van pool, and reductions for affordable housing. Um, in terms of local jurisdictions, so in Alexandria, we compare ourselves often to Washington, D.C., because the city of Alexandria is actually very similar to Washington, D.C. Um, Arlington County is less dense than Alexandria, but still highly relevant and suburban-oriented community um, in some ways similar to, uh, to Alexandria. Montgomery County, Maryland is also a, a useful comparator, uh, particularly for the urbanized sections of Montgomery County that are uh, adjacent to transit. Um, so it's a very large county, so the population density is much lower, but that's because there are some very, very rural sections of Montgomery County. National jurisdictions, we were looking at places that had less than 10,000 people per square mile. That included um, San Diego, Portland, Oregon, San Jose, Milwaukee, Oakland, Seattle and Los Angeles, and all of those cities actually have lower population densities than both Alexandria and the city of uh, both Alexandria and District of Columbia. Um, so we also looked at some jurisdictions with more than 10,000 people per square mile, 
Um, uh, Philadelphia is slightly higher density than both Alexandria and DC, um, Chicago, Boston, and San Francisco. Um, and then also looked at New York, which has um, tremendous density, much more than any other city in the country, um, as you'd imagine. A, a useful comparator because of the um, policies that they've enacted to, um, to create parking standards there. So we also looked at the tools that those organizations, those other uh, municipalities were using to manage their parking. And we came across some interesting tools like the King County Parking Calculator in uh, the Seattle region. And here you see a map of, of King County and you can put in a particular location and uh, it uses various statistics, including population density and, and job density, transit service and other factors to help estimate what the utilization would be at that site and which is used as a tool for informing um, what parking might be required in that location so we found that to be interesting wasn't exactly the route that we went with our approach but um, there are some interesting tools out there that other cities around the country are using to uh, provide for what what would um, how they determine their parking i think in the end this king county approach takes so the statistics regarding population and job density as a given. And part of what we're trying to do in Alexandria, especially in those transit oriented areas that um, might not have the full development that we're looking for yet, may not have the statistics that um, would, would tie to the policies. We want to plan for what we want to be there in time as opposed to what we have at the moment where we think there will be significant redevelopment of areas. So to turn it back to the city, um, then the next thing we did was to collect information on existing sites throughout the city. And so Alexandria has um, some distinct uh, neighborhoods within the, within the city. So the eastern side of the city, the older part of the city where Old Town Alexandria is, is much more dense and um, uh, parts of it are much more trip oriented than other parts of the city. Um, so we had 10 sites from that area that was the uh, adjacent to the Braddock Road, King Street, and Eisenhower Metro stations and the Car Carlisle, Eisenhower East, Old Town, Braddock sections of the city. We also looked to sites north of there in the Delray and Arlandria area of the city. So that's an area that's Fairly dense, fairly walkable, but not as accessible to transit as the area where we selected 10 sites. And then we looked at three sites in the west end of the city. So once you get uh, west of Quaker Lane, uh, you're in a section of Alexandria that was annexed in the 1950s and has a uh, much different, much more suburban uh, uh, land use patterns. Um, similar to what you would see in some of the surrounding Fairfax County, just because of the era when that uh, part of the city was developed. So we looked at three sites out in that area, the vicinity of the former Landmark Mall and, uh, and, and other parts uh, of the city along the Van Dorn corridor uh, adjacent to I-395. So when we go to the data collection um, that we, well, we pulled, so we had the sites and we, um, uh, because there's some sensitivity in terms of the, the, the very specific data regarding these sites, we didn't disclose the site names publicly, but we had the information that consultants went out and looked at how much park was being provided, what was the average demand um, for that parking, um, what was the demand in terms of uh, per unit and per bedroom. We were really trying to, with some of the data we were collecting, try to get a sense of what was the best factor we could use to help size what our expectations were with respect to parking? Uh, because the per unit count doesn't always get at the fact that a large unit might have more drivers than a, than a smaller unit. Um, so really trying to gauge this based on uh, the, the nature of the unit as opposed to something that just assumed every unit had um, flat demand um, was important here. Um, so let's talk about the recommendations that we had uh, based on that, which is uh, the next slide. So 
part of what we were looking at was what should the standards be and should we have the same standards citywide or should we have different standards where transit access is better? And we focused in, she came up with two different standards. One where areas are metro accessible and you can see in gray there, the city's four existing metro rail stations. So those areas have a parking uh, maximum now of 0.8 spaces per bedroom. And outside that metro walk shed was one space per bedroom. And these maps are based on the walk shed, the metro. That's why, for example, the station to the left, the Van Dorn station, has a very flat uh, uh, access line to it because there's a railroad track there. It would be, you cannot, you know, even though you might be uh, the way the f crow flies within a quarter mile of the metro station, um, if you were on the other side of that line, you wouldn't be able to walk there very easily. So we wanted to keep track and 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 um, uh, place the expectations on what would be a reasonable walk shed and what what was a realistic walk shed and a possible walk shed as opposed to just theoretical um, distances when when the walkability of the network doesn't permit that. Katie will talk in a moment about what we looked at with respect to the commercial parking standards because one of the interesting things there was that um, we moved away from this map to a more diverse definition of what uh, transit accessible areas are that we should consider for the purposes of commercial. She'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, next slide is what did we come up with in terms of the actual standards? So um, we, well, we, we had the standard of, of 0.8 or one space per, per bedroom, but then we also wanted to reflect the fact that regardless of whether you're near transit or elsewhere in the city, there were other factors that could impact your walkability that we should provide some reductions in what your uh, would be required to provide to account for the fact that if you had access to four or more bus routes, that could make it just as transit accessible um, as being near Metro. And we do see some very dense developments in parts of Old Town, Alexandria, and, and the Arlandria area that I mentioned a moment ago. They're not near Metro. They're not within walking distance of Metro, but they have very high usage and um, very high transit orient orientation, even though they're not on rail transit. Um, walkability is important. So it's not just about what people are walking uh, to transit, but also to their everyday uses in their neighborhood. And that's important that you be able to get around your neighborhood and have things easy and easy reach on foot. So we gave a credit for walkability. Studios, uh, the statistics were showing that where there were studios, people were demanding less parking. So giving a credit um, of 5% if 20% of the development was studios was another way of um, not only accounting for the fact that there could be lower um, demand from studios, but also incentivizing uh, developers to build those because you reduce the cost of delivering a studio if there's less parking required to serve them. And then finally, we have one bus rapid transit or BRT line in operation in the city at the moment from the Braddock Metro running north through Potomac Yard and Crystal City to the Pentagon City area of Arlington and, and what's uh, now known as the National Landing Area, where Amazon and Virginia Tech will be locating their campuses. And we wanted to account for the fact that uh, there should be a credit in those areas that are adjacent to BRT because of the frequency of service, um, which, which makes it much more able to be transit oriented. So there's a credit for that as well. So these credits are additive to each other and, and you could potentially receive a credit of um, up to around 30% or so uh, that, that you would be uh, enabled to provide less parking if you met all these standards and were, um, uh, you know, it'd be a reduction of 30% if you were outside a metro zone or a reduction around a maximum of 20% if you were inside a metro zone because we're already starting with a lower uh, rate for areas within the metro zone. So the other thing that we looked at too was not just market rate, parking standards for market rate, but also for affordable housing because um, where you provide um, affordable housing or public housing or um, other types of housing that are not market rate, 
the demand for parking tends to be much less uh, because people um, that are less able to afford housing are very frequently also less able to afford automobiles and therefore don't have vehicles to park. So we took that into account so that um, there's, there's much less of a parking requirement for um, affordable housing. And these were also, we, we went with the per unit standard on affordable housing as opposed to the per bedroom standard. Because um, one of the things that was true of affordable housing is that as the number of bedrooms increased, the demand for parking was not similarly increasing the way that we saw this, the statistics change with market rate housing. So, um, this, so this takes into account not only the affordability at various um, area median income ranges. Um, so the higher the area median income that you're serving with a with a particular um, project, um, the more parking you would you would enable. Um, but as it goes down, the, the parking required would also go down. So a couple challenges to highlight here in terms of this. Um, we've talked a little bit about bedrooms versus units. Um, another one is walkability index versus walk score. So the Alexandria standard takes into account walkability and we have our own uh, mechanism for computing walkability based on um, access to everyday amenities. It was important that we have a methodology for doing that that was not based on an opaque proprietary algorithm like the walk score. Um, so walk score was kind of what we were after with walkability index, but we didn't want to be dependent on their product in order to drive our um, policy. So it, 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 we have our own walkability index that approximates what a walk score might compute. Um, the development value of parking reductions. Um, so there was this question here of whether you're giving something away to developers because you no longer were requiring them to build more parking than they needed so that they're less to negotiate away um, uh, for public benefits in a project. But where we wound up on this as a city was that you've got to put your policies in place that achieve the urban design that you want and, and, and the um, parking and transportation demands that are appropriate for the city and that you shouldn't have artificial, uh, artificially inflated standards so that you can negotiate away for public benefits, that, that it's imperative to have the policies tailored to what the public objectives are that you want. Um, there was a public perception that we were reducing parking regardless of need. We talked about newspaper headlines earlier and um, the passion for parking, but th that that was, um, you know, in the end, what we've what we've found, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, is that there was, um, uh, you know, the the, the 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 early results are showing that 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 we're getting it right in terms of what we're building because before we would have very large garages that were empty in the bottom of buildings. It wasn't that we were taking away parking that people were using. It's that we were building parking that nobody needed. And we're much closer now in terms of providing what people need. And so the impact on surrounding streets and neighborhoods has been virtually non-existent because the supply is sufficient to meet the demands. On-street parking eligibility also has a factor here because there's, uh, you know, the, 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 the conundrum of will people choose to take their chances on the street if they're able to instead of paying for parking in their building if you have unbundled parking and you don't require parking as part of a, of a development. And that's been a challenge where the city's own on-street parking standards for new development have um, changed in terms of permit uh, ability to qualify for permits for those. And at the moment, um, in areas where there's high demand for parking, uh, new developments are not eligible for uh, on-street parking, and therefore that would drive those um, tenants to avail themselves of the parking that's being built in their buildings to the extent that they want to have a reserve base to park their car, because um, they, they would be limited in terms of their ability to park uh, during the business day or in some blocks on evenings and, and even weekends because um, they wouldn't be eligible for a permit. So I think that takes us to some of the issues we discussed with phase one and I will turn it back over to um, Melissa who's going to talk about phase two commercial. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you so much, Nate. <clears throat> um, so happily, in, a few years later, the, um, the task force reassembled and some of the participants, such as Nate, had been there for the residential part of the um, deliberations. Others, like me, were new to the task force. <clears throat> the, um, and just as a refresher from Katie's part of the presentation, this task force had representatives from the Planning Commission, Transportation Commission, our Traffic and Parking Board, an Old Town Area Parking Study Group, and various kinds of at-large at residents, as well as um, Business Association and the development community, particularly folks with experience in and out of um, developing commercial uh, projects in and outside of Alexandria. We um, had about nine task force meetings, so the, the process um, ran similarly. We had about nine task force meetings over the course of so many months, and staff also gave numerous presentations, about 14 presentations to various stakeholder groups, keeping them apprised of the process. And also similar to the first go around, uh, we kicked off the, the process with a, a keynote speaker, Todd Littman from the Victoria Transport Policy Institute. Um, those of you who are deep in um, transportation management and parking would be familiar with his work, and um, he's done a lot of great writing and sort of synthesis research about the state of practice, and he was able to present a very big picture um, perspective to local stakeholders to help the Alexandria folks who are about to begin this work locally think about where Alexandria's decision-making fits in with stuff going on nationally and globally. Also similar to the residential process, staff did a, a heck of a lot of um, data collection and synthesis research to feed the work of the working group. For purposes of commercial parking, we were looking at these four uh, land use categories, primarily office, hotel, restaurant, and retail. And I'll talk a little bit about how broad retail is, but one of the outcomes of this process was actually to bundle a lot of things into the broad category of retail for purposes of setting parking standards. And the main rationale behind that was really a lack of variation in need across um, more detailed use categories, but also simplification so that as a building or a space turns over from one kind of retail tenant to another, there isn't a need to re-examine the parking requirement for that location. Um, the data, similar to the residential process, consisted of uh, comps, so evaluation of other similar local jurisdictions, other similar um, national jurisdictions, and a lot of data collection or use of other local data that was actually about uh, commercial land uses here in Alexandria. So the data collection for the process that was very localized included 60 sites within Alexandria surveyed um, with their parking occupancy surveyed at peak use times, which was determined by a typical peak of time for, for the land use in question, um, as well as past surveys of other similar sites. So um, there was a data uh, bank, so to speak, from Arlington County of several office uses where their parking occupancy was counted, so that was also added to this overall data set. Um, there was cell phone activity at the sites in specific circumstances known by staff. So various types of data sets were aggregated together in order to provide us this really comprehensive list of um, sites and the details about their parking, about their land use, um, parking pricing, and so on. Um, travel surveys were conducted at 22 sites, and that was a um, sort of asking people, talk, talking to people and looking at um, a little bit more information in depth about how they arrived at the site and if they parked where they parked, on site or on street. So that was another um, layer of information that was added to this very robust data collection at the local level. So some of the results of this of these data um, collected were that every site except for one had a lower parking demand than the required parking under, under their current um, code experience. 59% of 
was the average peak occupancy of the commercial parking. And only six sites were more than 85% full, which we use as a good proxy for pretty full um, and that, that sensibility. 32% um, of people reported traveling to hotels via taxis, Uber, and Lyft. And this, was a, this is a, an important stat because when we talk about our requirements for the hotels, it's really about um, acknowledging that how people get to hotels these days and in this particular market is, is different than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and in particular, this market is well served by alternatives to having your own car. And it really makes it possible for you to be a tourist or a visitor here and use other modes. And so 32% arriving by taxi, Uber, and Lyft, so that doesn't count Metro, and a lot of our hotels are on Metro. 52% um, of reported restaurant trips did not drive to the restaurant. This was a real surprise, and it's important to note, and we'll look at a map again in a second, but um, this, didn't in, this was not including restaurants right on our King Street Old Town Commercial Corridor. So a lot of people would instinctually say, oh, those are just the restaurants on King Street where they don't have parking and people know they can't drive there, and it serves by... Um, a free trolley and so on. But no, these, these were restaurants basically everywhere else in the city, and 52% of those trips were arriving at the restaurants without driving, which is remarkable. Um, and we, we noted in that research that some sites are leasing space to others to utilize the excess parking that they have. So again, similar to the structure of the residential parking policy development, we looked back at how does a map help us. And we really wanted to make sure that the final product of the working of the task force was a map, a combination of a map and thresholds, essentially, um, uh, mins and maxes to describe as clearly as possible so there wouldn't have to be a lot of negotiation or debate what standards were any individual commercial development was being held to, commercial um, use was being held to. So this map, City of Alexandria, but you'll notice it looks a bit different than the map that Nate showed you. And um, there are several reasons for that. One is that um, transportation conditions are changing. So the, what you see on the far left-hand side of the western side of the city is, uh, are a bunch of, it's pretty small, but um, little green triangles representing the future stops of a West End transit way. And that wraps the, the west side. On the east side, north of Old Town into Potomac Yard, you'll see metro rail station entrances that um, don't exist yet and will be existing soon because Alexandria is actually building um, an infill metro rail station to serve that part of the community. And in between the west end and um, the east end, there's this section of gray area in the middle that represents our Duke Street BRT corridor. This is another tra um, high capacity transit corridor that doesn't quite exist yet. The, the BRT infrastructure doesn't exist, but, but it's in the planning um, process. And we wanted to make sure that the standards that we were setting in place would um, be looking ahead at the, the incredible investments in transit that Alexandria is making and the ways that that's going to change people's demand and need for driving to various types of commercial destinations. So we were using primarily half-mile transit walk sheds to map areas that could be qualified as in, within an enhanced transit corridor or transit area. And folks that were outside of that area would be held to a different parking standard. Um, there were some minor modifications that we had to make to this map. Um, and it's going to be, I don't know if there's a good way for me to I don't know if people can see my cursor or not. Maybe you can. Um, but there were some added areas that don't technically count as a half mile. Um, there's a small area in the south end of Old Town that was added on to the enhanced transit area um, section because it does have a stretch of commercial uses. It is commonly walked to and connects really well to the downtown um, sort of Old Town core. And there's a, a, a fair bit of bus service that... Um, that transpires in that, in that segment of roadway. We also added to the half mile area is a section of, of land up here in the northeast, um, what we call Old Town North, 
that is a recently a decommissioned power plant and, and is going to be redevelopment sites within the foreseeable future. And we wanted to make sure that the transit that would ultimately be planned, the connectivity for that, was not ignored um, in the planning for these sheds. Um, another minor addition that we made, and this is just to, pointing out the nuance of this because you're talking about setting out policy for commercial uses, and inevitably at the hearings, you're getting all the exceptional cases where commercial use is stymied because it's being treated unfairly compared to how your policy was set out. In our um, Del Rey neighborhood along the Mount Vernon Avenue corridor, this is this is a street that's that's bounded on each side by commercial uses, and yet the half mile transit walk shed, technically speaking, would have run straight down the center of Mount Vernon Avenue. So we added the blocks on the other side to acknowledge that half the commercial businesses in that corridor would be oddly treated differently when it comes to parking requirements than the businesses just across the street from them. So I just wanted to highlight those, um, those peculiarities of it, and, uh, and now we'll talk about what, what the map means. So with all the data co collection that we looked at, the, um, the map is ultimately telling folks that if you're a hotel use within the enhanced transit area, this is the minimum and maximum ratio of parking spaces per room that you would be expected to provide. Um, a hotel use beyond the enhanced transit area gets a different minimum and max. And we did the same for office uses, retail uses, and restaurant uses. And some of the um, features here that I want to highlight, and I'm not getting into the nitty gritty with these um, these parking ratios, but in essence, they arose out of a lot of detailed discussion on the data that staff were able to uh, compile for us. But we achieved uh, an increase in consistency by switching up the way the restaurant parking was calculated to a per thousand square foot basis instead of per seat, which it used to be um, done before. So now office, retail, and restaurant are all consistently treated the same way with per thousand square feet. Um, and as I mentioned before, the uh, retail ratio is a highly simplified uh, prospect because there are many different kinds of retail uses or like retail uses that are grouped in that category for this purpose. And again, it's to simplify things because when we see land uses turn over, uh, a yoga studio might turn into a bubble tea shop, and we really just didn't want to have to cause these small businesses to come back to us every time they change to ask for permission to have us overlook a particular detail associated with their parking requirement. Um, this slide is an example of the kind of visualization that was provided for us by staff um, to help us see how the proposal, um, and again, this is within the enhanced transit area versus outside the enhanced transit area, how our mins and max compared to um, to the left, a bunch of existing Alexandria data sources, existing zoning, our small area plans, recent project approvals and observations in the, in the data that was collected for this process, as well as uh, regional comps and Cambridge being a, a non-regional comp. So Washington, D.C., Arlington, Annapolis, Falls Church, Frederick City, Maryland, Montgomery County, Maryland, and Cambridge. So, we were, this is, it's like a gut check, making sure that the, the ranges that we were proposing really fell in line with what we are seeing locally, what was putting us in the right direction in the framework of our long range objectives for the city and how it compared to similar jurisdictions that were seeing similar types of land development and car ownership as Alexandria. This is a similar visualization. It's the gut check against the, the sites in our sample um, showing the in the blue, it's the proposed range in its for within the enhanced transit area, and the yellow shaded box is the proposed range um, outside of the enhanced transit area, and the and the dots similar sites in those data sets. So again, we were making sure that the range that we were setting seemed feasible for our potential future applicants. A couple detailed um, policy decisions that were made. One was the, excuse me, the um, 
decision to waive a parking requirement as long as it was two spaces or less. So based on all those calculations that we talked about, 1,000 um, parking spaces per thousand square feet, for instance, if it's a small business and it's only it only needs a parking space, we're just not going to make that be the barrier to entry. Uh, and this, frankly, happens a fair bit. We see we see small businesses in the base of, of new developments or in existing older um, construction. And the fact that this is waived, one, does not demonstrably change the situation of how services are being rendered at those buildings and prevents um, the parking requirement from being an obstacle to small businesses opening. Another um, important feature of our discussions was to, to really fine tune our shared parking options for, for projects, particularly larger projects, but also ones where there might be this um, issue with available parking on site, but there's still a fair bit, as Katie showed you way early in the presentation, um, a fair bit of parking available around the city on surface lots or other structured parking. So we made it clear that parking within 1,000 feet, previously it was 500 feet, can be used to meet the parking requirement. We were looking at walkability. How far do people reasonably walk? These are, if they're employees of commercial businesses, they're, they're in a routine commute just like everybody else, and they're willing to walk more than 500 feet to get to their parking spaces. And this really opens up options for um, new projects. Um, lastly, challenges we faced, I'm just going to talk about, highlight a couple. Um, the perception that reducing the parking requirement is a giveaway to developers. This challenge, just as Nate pointed out, five years ago was true. Um, just a couple years ago when we were going through the second secondary process and we wanted to make sure that everyone in, in the conversation, it's about supporting great businesses being here in Alexandria and that that doesn't mean um, right-sizing parking and making it reasonable is a giveaway. Um, another challenge that I want to highlight is the fear that reducing the requirement would mean a, a loss in parking. And it's important to point out these are forward-facing requirements for new businesses moving in and for new buildings. Um, there's no parking being taken away here. We still have that inventory of parking, and in many respects, more parking than we need, that we need to be able to use better. And so it was really important throughout the process that we communicate that this doesn't change uh, over supply that we have in a lot of parts of the community, but really in some respects, particularly with the shared parking provisions, um, allows us to use that parking more efficiently. All right, uh, this is Katie again. Mm -hmm. So we've had these new requirements in place for five years for the residential uh, requirements and then two years for the commercial. So how's it, how's it been going? Um, I think we've had a number of successes. So uh, probably our largest success has been the number of new affordable units that we've been able to um, approve here in the city. So since 2015, we've had five new affordable housing developments that have been approved and are um, either just online or getting ready to be um, completed or under construction. So that, that represents a huge number of affordable units um, that has now opened up more units for, for the residents in the city. Um, in terms of market rate development, we're also seeing a lot of um, new residential development taking advantage of these uh, new requirements as well. So we've had over a dozen new developments using these standards, and we've actually had a few developments that were already built come back through to request consideration under the new standards because uh, they felt like they could use their parking that um, had previously been required for better use. So the picture up in the top left is Actually, um, I don't know if you remember from the beginning of the presentation, there was a parking lot, um, and this particular development felt that they needed to provide some more amenity space, and that parking lot wasn't um, as vital to them as having that amenity space, so they were able to take advantage of the requirements for that. In terms of commercial development, um, these are still pretty new, but we've had several new developments um, using these requirements. The picture in the top right is a new hotel that's been proposed here in the middle of Old Town. And what's unique about this is they are not building any new parking with this building. So this is, this is an existing building and it would have been um, hard to add more parking to this site. So what they did to satisfy their parking requirement was to find a garage nearby uh, within that thousand, square, thousand feet um, and take advantage of satisfying their requirements that way. 
Um, and then we've had a number of buildings that are mixed of uses where previously you would have had to uh, provide this amount of parking for a retail, this amount for a daycare, this amount for all these other different types of uses. And um, the new requirements allow them a little bit more flexibility so they can flex in and out the different uses as, um, as they get built. And just overall, we've seen fewer parking rejection requests go to, go to City Council, which has been huge, um, given that most of the developments that we were taking through had a parking reduction. So as always, there's always going to be some room to improve. So some of the things that we have been looking at um, or will be looking at in the future will be um, looking at those two maps. So you might have noticed those two maps were similar but not quite alike, um, which is something that we want to consider perhaps merging to um, make that a little bit more consistent, make it uh, more understandable for people um, using those two different maps, particularly for those developments that have a mixed use of a facet to it. The walkability index, um, as Nate mentioned, we have developed our own walkability index instead of using walk score. So now that we've had a few developments using this, um, really taking a look at is that meeting the intent of what that credit was for? Are we, are we um, capturing enough people that are in a truly walkable environment or are we excluding people because it's, it's too strong? So we need to take a look at that. Uh, the studio credit is one where I don't think we've had any developments take advantage of this particular credit, so we need to look at whether it's um, too high of a threshold to achieve or if it's um, something that is just is changing with the market and what people are demanding in terms of residential units. Uh, we have some outdoor dining uh, exemptions that um, have, have come into play in a few different developments that um, I think we could clarify those a little bit better because this is getting into um, space that's required for parking when it's not actually in an enclosed building. So that per thousand square feet gets a little bit uh, harder for us to, to apply. Um, so there's some, some room for improvement there. And then lastly, the application to existing developments. So developments that have already been built, um, they've gone through a public process. Right now they can't use the new um, standards unless they go back through a public process. So looking at ways to, to um, streamline that a little bit easier. So in terms of what's next, um, first we need to evaluate the changes and how are they working? Are they doing what we intended to do? Um, we've had, as I mentioned, um, the residential in place for about five years. We're starting to see many of those new developments that use those requirements come online. Um, so over the next few years, I think we need to take a look at how those parking garages are being used and are we still seeing a lot of extra parking that's going unused or have we hit the sweet spot or are we are we have we created a problem that we now need to look at um, uh, addressing on the on street spaces uh, with regard to development entitlements uh, we need to be looking at how they we apply the new standards to the old development so that we can uh, find a way to maximize or use that excess parking that's going unused, but is technically required to be there from a zoning perspective. Um, our next phase of this, um, there's still a number of different categories in our in our zoning ordinance that haven't been touched that are still decades old in terms of requirements. Um, so looking at how we bring those standards up into play uh, up into um, current practices. So this is the industrial groups, schools, and churches, which are which are hard groups to be able to, to review, but that is um, identified as a future phase. And then lastly, along with any other, any of the off-street parking requirements we are looking at, we also have a number of other parking strategies to manage on-street spaces um, so that we recognize that both of those go hand in hand and that we need to continue to work on our on-street management. So with that, um, I'll leave this slide up. This is um, a link to all the data that Nate and Melissa mentioned. Um, it's available on this website, as well as all the task force information and um, a link to some of the summaries here. And then our contact information if anyone has any specific questions that they wanted to email us about after that. But I, I'm going to turn it back over to Paige for questions. All right, thank you guys, and thank you again to our presenters. Um, we do have a few questions um, if you have some time to answer them. Sure. Okay, our first question is regarding the residential recommendations where the number of spaces per bedrooms with 
within and outside the metro walk shed the maximum or minimum number of spaces? Um, so that number was intended to be the essentially the maximum, and then from there you could apply the credits to bring it down so that you had that range. So anywhere between that that base number and then lower after you took the credits was was intended to be that range for what you could apply. Now we did have a um, like a five percent wiggle room clause in our zoning ordinance that allows for some flexibility if. Um, during construction, there's something that comes up that impacts one of those spaces um, that we didn't want somebody to have to go back through that whole council process just for a small number of, of spaces. But in its essence, it's, it's the minimum and maximum. Okay, and our next question is, in terms of the recommendations credit slide, it appears you base your analysis on geography, and amenity. This assumes certain resident behaviors, i.e. choosing to take transit. Did you do any resident behavior survey to adjust for this? I'd say for the residential, we didn't have that um, on-site travel survey that we did with the commercial where we were asking people how they got around. Um, so that that is an interesting point. I think I think for the residential, we we mainly were looking at um, what we observed in the in the garages and what we observed in that those neighborhoods in terms of what was available. Um, but I don't think that we included any of the um, any kind of surveys of the actual residents for how they preferred to get around. How can this apply to small rural communities? Well, I, I think the process that we used um, is probably a good way that it can apply to small cities, big cities, any kind of city, and really recognizing like what are what are what are your standards? How do they compare with other cities um, that are like you, and maybe cities that you aspire to be like, or cities that are just doing something really um, really innovative? So getting that baseline there, and then. And then doing a, a really robust data collection effort to see what what are the conditions on the ground in your city, what's specific to your city in terms of um, how people get around, how people demand parking, how they're using transit, um, and where those things um, relate. So I think using that process of really understanding what what is um, what's happening in your city, and then from there um, coming up with some recommendations that make sense for your city. Um, can you all make these slides available um, to our to our attendees after this? Sure, be happy to. Okay, we will share it in the follow-up email. Um, in Alexandria, what mechanism is used to waive the creation of off-street parking in areas adequately served but require parking to require parking be provided in areas inadequately served. Could you repeat that question? Sure. In Alexandria, what mechanism is used to waive the creation of off-street parking in areas adequately served, but require parking be provided in areas inadequately served? So I think what, what the questioner is getting at is like, how does this fit into the uh, use approval process? And I think it, it varies a little bit if the use can pass through an administrative process that staff just undertakes, then it's as simple as, as staff doing a back of the envelope calculation and looking at what's available in the applicant's package and on the site. And if it all matches up um, according to these new thresholds and standards, then N nothing further is needed, and if the if the project though is bigger, some of the stuff that was discussed um, that Katie showed are um, what we call development special use permits. They're like whole block or partial block uh, development projects that have multiple land uses in it, and in those they're already going through a council process. Um, they'll go before several commissions for recommendation, but in the staff report and analysis and applicants analysis leading up to the recommendations they're hoping to achieve, the parking would be considered with the same thresholds and it just won't be um, 
it'll it'll be properly addressed, and it would it would change what they might be proposing, and allow them to um, use land, use space and density for other purposes instead of having to build it out with more parking. Um, it is now one o'clock. Do we? Do you have some time to answer? Um, a few more questions, or would you um, just like me to send these to you? I think we have a few more minutes if you have more questions. Sure. Can you repeat yourself? I'm sorry. Sure, we'd be happy to answer more questions. Um, okay. You mentioned some locations were leasing spaces. What uses were leasing? What uses were leasing those spaces, and are those uses under part? So the uh, the scenario is actually um, a building that has extra parking because it was required to be built with more parking then ultimately ended up being necessary based on the users in the building. And they're the ones who, if possible and allowed for under their um, permits, actually lease out their extra space to other users in, in buildings that are nearby. So that, that's the scenario. And I think um, in the cases that you've um, seen, Katie, it's mixed use buildings, right? So they have multiple uses in the building that are ultimately underutilizing the parking garage. Yes. I mean, I think it was, you know, the restaurant who needed a few spaces here and there, um, they would find a space in a, in a garage like this that might be across the street from them. Or um, in a few cases, there were some residential buildings, I believe, that had some extra spaces that they were able to lease out for like a monthly parker or something like that. And I would just add that part of what we were trying to do with this effort was to unlock some of the parking that was required to be set aside for compliance with the zoning ordinance. So you might have a very large, a very large mixed use development that had a very large parking garage and it technically needed all of that parking to comply with its special use permit based on the parking standard in effect at the time that that development was constructed. But as a practical matter, that building might have significant underutilization of its parking. And so you have the zoning ordinance saying, the building is parked up and can't be used for any other use, but you have perhaps a restaurant across the street that needs to identify parking and could potentially lease from that site, but the zoning ordinance wouldn't permit it because they were already required to set aside parking based on square footage of office or whatever might be part of that development. And part of what we were trying to do is to create a mechanism for those development special use permits for those types of garages to be reopened and to allow the reallocation of that parking um, based on the new standards so that you could tailor the required parking to what's actually demanded uh, based on the new standards and, and, and to the extent that you could inform it even further by what the actual use in that building is, you might be able to allow uh, leasing of the parking to comply with the zoning ordinance um, uh, so that you make further use of that parking in that building, um, not just as a practical matter, but also as a legal matter to, to cover um, the parking needs of adjacent businesses. So that flexibility in sharing the use of parking um, where the under parking is occurring and revisiting the previous approvals to allow for the fact that there was more parking than might be uh, needed um, was a really important feature of the commercial standards. Regarding commercial shared parking arrangements, how do you keep track or, or monitor the parking requirements for all the uses over time? In other words, how would you make sure that the hotel still has a shared parking arrangement with the off-site parking lot? Yeah, so that, that is a real challenge and that's something that we're still struggling with. Um, we have looked at ways to add some flags some parcel flags in our permitting system so that we know that this development has an agreement to share parking with another development. Um, but at the end of the day, when we talked with our attorneys, they felt like this is just another um, example of a, of a zoning violation. So if, 
that it's not something that we needed to go out and actively double check each each year but if there was a complaint that came in it was up to the developer or the owner of that property to say how they were still in compliance with that with that agreement so it's not um a super smooth process but it's it's um it's something that we're still working through but i think it's 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 something that we have been able to address in, at least um in some to some extent you know what we're most likely to see is a parking a surface parking lot get proposed for redevelopment that may have been used by a previous um, use approval as part of their shared parking uh, or part of their parking uh, allowance, so to speak. So in that case, um, the owner of that lot has every right to redevelop it under um, Alexandria's policies and codes, and it's really on the other use that is through lease relying on that lot for, for their parking requirement to begin the process as they know it is, it is going to go through a redevelopment process, begin the process to locate a, dish, a different source of their shared parking requirement to meet their, their requirement. And I should say that one thing that we changed was instead of putting the specific location for where that, that use was going to be sharing parking in the approval, we said that they have to provide parking per the code within that thousand square foot area. So that way, when a surface parking lot that they might have been leasing from did eventually redevelop and they had to find new parking, they didn't have to go back through the council process to find new parking as long as it was in within that, that thousand square foot area and could still meet the code. Okay, this will be the last question. Um, uh, and I will send the rest of the questions to you later. Um, so did the city consider any regulations that new structured parking be constructed in a manner that it may be adapted to alternative uses should parking demand decrease significantly in the future due to new technologies or any other reason? So that's something we've been talking about a lot, especially with some of our new small area plans. It wasn't anything that we actually put into the, the zoning ordinance that would require that type of development. But as we are evaluating different developments on a case-by-case -case basis, and um, it seems like it may be in an area that may need parking now, but won't in the future, we've been trying to encourage that, that type of design so that we do have that flexibility in the future. Um, I, at, at this point, though, we don't have any specific requirements to do it. It's more aspirational in terms of we think that this would be a good thing for you to include in your development. It's, and it's worth mentioning, Katie, too, that the city council just approved a new small area plan for the Eisenhower East neighborhood on Saturday that does just that, that requires the new parking there to be able to be convertible um, should the market shift um, in the future. So that is something we're definitely looking at and, and implementing in, in areas um, such as around the Eisenhower Avenue Metro Station, where we're expecting a lot of growth in the near term. All right. Thank you again to our presenters. Um, and thank you for all those that attended today. Any unanswered questions um, will be sent to you so that you may receive the answers to your questions. And as always, please look for um, the recorded webinar to be posted to the chapter's YouTube page. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.